by agreement, uh, next member is Vancouver West End. Thank you, uh, Honorable Chair. Um, I come bringing a, a message, bringing a call for action, which I'm sure many of us heard this summer as we traveled our constituencies, as we traveled the province, and that's that we have to value our water better. That's that we have to take care of the stuff of life. As I speak, of course, NASA is unveiling that they have been studying water movements on Mars and believe that they have found for the first time evidence that water flows on the surface of Mars in the summer. Now, why did they want to look for that? Well, of course, because they believe that without water, it's pretty darn difficult to have life. And that's true here, that's true of Mars, and uh, so congratulations to those scientists for working so hard to find water on Mars. Well, we've got a, a lot of it on BC, but this summer we discovered that in some cases we just didn't have enough. Myself, while hiking uh, Cape Scott Provincial Park, discovered, of course, that, well, where it showed there was water on the map that you could get to drink, well, in the middle of August, the likelihood and the reality was that, no, there was no water there at all. Uh, farmers have found that. Folks in the uh, uh, northeast in the industries, uh, oil and gas. Uh, of course, we've seen that with forest fires and the droughts, and on and on we go. But, you know, BC is a province which largely succeeds in, in many cases because of our water. Of course, George Vancouver came this way looking for a water passage through to the, north, the Northwest Passage. Many First Nations communities, of course, the vast majority are based in areas where there is water. Our cities and towns that built up after settlement are no different. But, Honorable Speaker, for all that value, for the billions of dollars NASA spent, for the m money that many British Columbians spent to search for water, this government has not been there for our water, Honorable Speaker. It's been a summer of failure, a, a summer of failure that has shown how much more we have to do, how taking water for granted puts us all at risk. What do I speak of, Honorable Speaker? Well, I speak of a government that believes that, right now anyways, you can pull as much water out of the ground as possible for zero dollars. No studies, no research, no mapping of aquifers, cuts of 30% of our science officers, and then a reliance on self-reporting of how much water you use. Well, we've seen where that fails, Honorable Speaker. I speak of Fort Nelson First Nations, Treaty 8. Up in the northeast of this province, they have sometimes an abundance of water with snow, sometimes not a lot of water at all. They've had to shut off uh, water access for communities, for industry, because of droughts. Well, Treaty 8 First Nations, Fort Nelson, has been raising the issue of concern uh, in Sea Lake. Now, it's a smaller lake, but it's a lake where a company uh, was given the right to draw 2.5 billion liters of water a year. Now, Fort Nelson First Nation said to this government, well, the science shows that this is unsupportable, that this water system will drain out, will leave it in drought situations, will kill the fish, will kill the beaver, will have huge impact on this area that they use for hunting, for fishing, for their way of life. Well, the BC government said, no, that's nonsense, our science supports us. Well, Honorable Speaker, the Environmental Appeal Board showed that no, there was no science to support what the government was doing, and in fact, the company was pulling water from the lake when there was almost no water left during a drought. Did the government pay attention to Fort Nelson First Nations concerns? No, they didn't. The company kept drawing the water. It took them taking the government through the Environmental Appeal Board to finally get the government to, hold on, we guess we can't legally continue to allow you to drain this lake. Well, that's the amount of value this government puts towards water, the stuff of life, that they would allow a lake to run dry because an industry backer continued to say it was fine when no science supported it. Now, Honorable Speaker, that is not valuing our water. That's the kind of thinking that puts us all at risk. When you think that just saying something makes it true, when you have no science to back you up, that leads to failure. And that's what happened in the Northeast. But it's not just the Northeast, Honorable Speaker. We've seen challenges all across this province, where up in the Nicola Valley, uh, ranchers, uh, people who needed to fish, people who needed water for their own homes are all dealing with an issue there now where the water's been pulled out by so many people over so much time that they don't have maps for the aquifers, that they don't know who's pulling out which, what, where, how, that you're finding that fish can no longer swim up the streams because there's not enough water and they die. We find that in the Okanagan with, of course, climate change impacting that region. 
Well, again, some people pull a ton of water, some people pull a little bit less, some try to conserve, some waste. Honorable Speaker, BC still remains one of the worst wasters of water in the world, per capita, in the world. And this government sits there and says, well, okay, instead of zero dollars, maybe we'll charge $2.25 as our highest price for a million liters of water. $2.25 for a million liters of water. And meanwhile, when you say, we need to invest in conservation, we need to invest in research, uh, studies, as the member for uh, uh, Caribou dismissed, we actually do need that research. We do need this science so that we can plan ahead, so that we can work with agriculture, so that we can work with industry, so we can provide incentives for them. A proper valuation of water would allow us to provide incentives to industry to reduce their amount of uh, water wasted, the amount of water used, so there's more for all of us, so that the fish can have enough water to get up the stream. You know, Honorable Speaker, it was tough for me this, uh, this summer to watch in the Okanagan. I visited Penticton. They'd been working so hard to help salmon get up the Okanagan lakes. They were forecasting over 500,000 new salmon to finally come home again. But, Honorable Speaker, because of too much withdrawal of water, because of climate change and a lack of care for what that will do to water supplies, the vast majority of those fish never made it. The vast majority of the Fraser Salmon Run never made it. Millions upon millions of fish lost because, again, we're not planning ahead, we're not properly valuing our water so that it's there when the fish need it. Honorable Speaker, this requires action now. The government talks about vaguely, well, maybe we'll think about a better price, and geez, people were upset at us because we're giving Nestle water for free. Well, Honorable Speaker, it's not people being upset, it's people being outraged that this government is throwing away our ability to manage our water, to conserve our water, protect our water, by taking a short-sighted view that we're always going to have it. Well, California has shown that that's a bad point of view. That's a failing point of view as we see their industries struggle, as we see our food prices shoot up because they don't have water and they don't have enough of it. Meanwhile, here, we're giving it away for Thank nothing. Thank you, Member. Member for West Vancouver, see to Sky. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. These private member statements can present a real challenge in considering the, the preparation of a response. Today I have, quote, valuing the stuff of life, bracket water, bracket, unquote. What does this mean? It's so broad that the latitude for response is almost infinite. So I thought to myself, what, what comes to my mind? What does water mean to me? Well, for a farmer, it's a complicated relationship. At times, too much or maybe not enough. Depends on the weather. How hot is it? Are we irrigating? How is the well holding out? Is the water table high or low, dropping or rising? Well, last week in Pemberton, it was rising. A virtual atmospheric river of water was flowing across the Pacific from west to east, and it parked over the mountains of the upper Squamish and the Lillooet River Valleys. And in Pemberton, it rained. Heavy at times, but only 45 millimeters was totaled. However, in the mountains of the upper Lillooet, peaks more than twice the size of any on the North Shore, massive glaciers, summits like Salal and Meager, Plinth and Devastation received 120 millimeters in that same time on a very shallow, fresh snowpack. And a surge came down the 75 kilometers towards of the valley towards Pemberton and the river gauge climbed, oh how it climbed, 2.5 meters in just hours, from 200 cubic meters a second to 1,300 cubic meters a second. Practically unheard of. Roads washed out, workers and campers stranded. We watched in awe as the river churned and turned an ominous brown. We felt the bridge shudder as logs freshly afloat collided with the bridge and then twisted away. But the dikes of Pemberton held, kept the water in its banks until further downstream past Pemberton. In Mount Curry, the river jumped its course and spread across the land. On the river left at Quitcha, IR2, the water flowed deep, while across the way at the Pemberton fire base, the operations center for the Elaho and Boulder Creek fires of this, this past summer 
The river surged across the ground where in the smoke and heat of just months ago, the very spot where the Premier had stood and talked with firefighters was overwhelmed by the dirty brown floodwaters. Worse was happening just a few kilometers away at Nep Creek on the Birkenhead River. Much worse had happened. It is thought that thousands of feet above, the remnants of a small Cirque glacier finally collapsed after such a struggle with a hot, hot, dry summer. And the rain flushed through the rock and ice and water thousands of feet and burst down through a gully, shredding a rail line like so much spaghetti, crushing a high voltage transmission tower and overwhelming roads and homes and buildings, vehicles, greenhouses and orchards, smashing everything in its path, leaving in its wake nothing but mud and rock. It's incredible that no one was killed, but what is no surprise is how the community came together to support the families, how they were taken in, how the regional district and emergency management BC responded, how hydro and highways went above and beyond to bring the power back, to open up the area to the road to Darcy, Nequatqua, Seton and beyond. So this week in Pemberton, we were very lucky that the stuff of life did not take life. And that while families will need to recover and rebuild, we are grateful that they will not have to mourn. In the city, sometimes water you think of, it comes out of your tap and it runs down your drain. On the land, it is what swells and sprouts seed and unleashes life and its potential, or water can crash down and crush your hope, or travel overland and flood and drown and bring disease. Water shapes the landscape. It defines the cycles of the season. Water can bring forth growth or end it. Thank you, member. Water truly is the stuff of life. Thank you. Thank you. Member for Vancouver West End. And thank you, Honourable Chair. And thank you to the member for his moving uh, tribute to rescue workers, to his constituents uh, who have been affected by uh, too much water and, in some cases, uh, too little to begin with. We have an issue here where we are surrounded by water. We get a lot of water in the rain. And sometimes we feel we just have too much of it that we're growing moss on our backs. But no, Honourable Speaker, that abundance hides a great risk. We can all talk about how much water we got, how much rain there was. But Honourable Speaker, that abundance hides the fact that in the summer, sometimes we have no water at all. Months without rain. In parts of this province, their wells went dry. They had no water at all, and they're not sure they're going to get any again. And that myth of abundance puts us at risk when we don't value the water, when we think there's so much we don't really need to consider it. I think of the fact that we've had last year 3,500 spills of toxic, dangerous chemicals across this province. In more than half the cases, the Ministry of Environment didn't know how much was spilled, wasn't really clear what was spilled, who spilled it, and how they were going to clean it up. Why was that so, Honourable Speaker? Why did the emergency management folks in the Ministry of Environment admit there was so many gaps in their ability to respond to spills that they couldn't even write them down because they didn't have enough staff? Because this government has undervalued our resources, has undervalued the need to protect them, because they think they'll just go on and on and on forever. Well, while we may have large abundance of water at times, which can cause a disaster, we also have many cases where there is no water at all, and that causes a, a long-term disaster in agriculture, forestry, fisheries, mining. There's really very few industries that you could point to that don't have a major impact on water or from the water. So, Honourable Speaker, we on the New Democrats side believe you need to value water properly. You need to put a proper value on it so that government has the resources to properly protect it, to properly conserve it to properly incentivize and support industries to reduce their amount of water, to help people bring their bills down, because we don't need to see continuing water spiking in costs in some sectors where they have no ability to deal with it. 
and have their industries collapse. We can't stand that. But we can't stand by as we see industries disappear because this government does not manage water properly, does not plan for the future, does not do the analysis, the science, the research, and does not properly enforce the law to stop people from polluting it, to stop people from damaging our water resources. No, Honourable Speaker, the time for change is here. This government seems to think that they're in the 1950s where things just stretched on forever. Pollute, don't damage, don't manage. But that time is gone, Honourable Speaker. Thank you, it's time for real conservation, Thank real you. education, real prevention, real valuing to protect our water. Thank you, Honourable Speaker.